Hello, everyone. If you can hear me, can you please type it on the type your answer on the chat box? Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you very much. So we shall begin now. Salamat sore. Salamat petang. Magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the webinar on the history of pandemics in Southeast Asia. I am Dr. Fernando A. Santiago Jr., Director of the De La Salle University Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub in Manila, Philippines. I am the host of this webinar. This event is brought to you in partnership with the Philippine Historical Association, the Masyarakat sa Jarawan, Indonesia, and the National Quincentennial Committee of the Republic of the Philippines. The webinar is currently in broadcast in Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, other parts of Southeast Asia, and the rest of the world. As the world faces the challenges of COVID-19, we can look back to history to give us guidance. It is not the first time that Southeast Asia has had a pandemic. And in studying the history of pandemics, we can learn lessons that we can apply to the present. The history of pandemics goes beyond national borders. Therefore, while history, the history of diseases at the local level is important, it is also necessary to think of history in the regional scale. It is thus imperative to compare and learn from each other's experiences, which is the spirit of today's webinar. Hopefully, together, we will all rise from COVID-19. Allow me to say a few words in Filipino. Kami po ay nagpapasalamat sa inyong pagdalo at inaasahan namin na ang ating talakayan ay magbibigay ng mga aral na maaari nating gamitin para harapin ang mga pagsubok ng COVID-19. Muli, Maraming salamat at magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. Mabuhay. Thank you. And now, I would like to introduce you to my co-organizer, Dr. Andy Akdian of the Masyarakat Sajarawan, Indonesia. Thank you, Dr. Fernando. Uh, Hello, good afternoon. Hello, everyone. I wish all of you were all well and in good health. On behalf of Masyarakat Sejarawan Indonesia, Society of Indonesian Historians, I would like to thank to everyone here who have participated in this webinar. I would like to thank also to my colleagues from the Philippine Historical Association, Dr. Fernando Santiago and the Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub, the La Salle University for hosting this webinar. Special thanks I would like to address to our speakers today, Dr. Francis Delago, Dr. Parham Hong, Dr. Gani Jailani, as well as Reactor, Dr. Ma Luisa Kamagai, and Mr. Apandoli from Indonesia. Uh, it seems ironic that although we are geographically close, but actually we know little about what happened in our close neighbor. I felt myself as very few among my colleagues in Indonesia studying their colors neighbor as, 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 as the Philippines or and while I think the Philippines and Malaysia are a bit better studying about Indonesia. So I hope that this webinar will become a beginning for us, historian and social scientists in this region life, to be more engaged in our common problem, sharing and learning in the spirit of solidarity and mutual collaboration. Uh, I will speak, allow me to speak in Bahasa. Selamat sore. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, selamat sore teman-teman semua. Uh, 
kegiatan webinar ini menjadi uh, awal buat kita semua di Indonesia untuk saling bisa uh, bertukar pikiran dengan rekan-rekan kita di tempat-tempat lain di Filipina dan khususnya Malaysia juga uh, jadi saya berharap ini juga bisa menjadi satu kesempatan buat kita semua untuk bisa memperluas pandangan dan uh, tinjauan kita terhadap masalah yang kita harap hadapi bersama yaitu pandemi COVID-19. Uh, sebagai kata akhir, saya ucapkan terima kasih kepada partis, uh, atas partisipasi Anda dalam forum ini. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for um, I give it back to Dr. Fernando again. Thank you, Dr. Fernando. Thank you, Dr. Andy. And now we shall proceed to the lectures. Let me introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is a lecturer at the School of Social Sciences, University Science Malaysia. She uses a wide range of conceptual and analytical tools from across various disciplines in the field of social sciences to interrogate issues pertaining to medicine, health, and diseases, bodies, modernity, and nationalism. Recently, she has also developed interest in the politics of culture and politics of memory. Her geographic focus is mainly Malaysia, Southeast Asia, and East Asia. So ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Por Hyong Kong. Hi, uh, selamat petang semua. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, uh, Dr. Fernando, uh, for the introduction. Uh, can you all hear me? I just, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Dr. Fernando, for the introduction. Uh, and, and thanks, Search, MSI, and the Philippine Historical Association and um, the National Queen um, Centennial Committee for organizing this webinar. I think it is very important. And thanks for having me. It is such a great privilege to be here. And I'm really, really happy to see several faces of old friends here. Uh, it's like a reunion. And um, okay, my work has a lot to do with history of medicine, but actually uh, I am a social scientist and uh, I'm honored to be with all the Southeast Asian historians in today's panel. And as a social scientist, I can't imagine social sciences without history or history without social sciences. That's why I'm here. They need each other. Um, uh, okay, let me share my... PowerPoint here. Can you all see? Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, you can okay. see. Okay, thank you. So um, for today's uh, talk, uh, the theme of today's webinar is actually uh, the history of pandemic in Southeast Asia. But uh, I have framed my talk uh, to focus instead on the use of pandemic history in Southeast Asia. And I will move back and forth between, uh, you know, the use of um, pandemic history in um, both South Southeast Asia and Asia, East Asia a little bit now, I hope you don't mind. And the outline of my talk today is actually divided into uh, two uh, parts only, two major partners. So the first part, I'll talk about a recent history of the use of pandemic history. And then the second part of my talk will be about can past pandemic offers lesson for managing the present one? This is what uh, Dr. Fernando just mentioned uh, in, in the introduction, right? Uh, one of the purpose of this webinar is actually to learn historical lesson from the past. And uh, so I'll talk a little, uh, some, some story about how uh, past pandemic has been used. Okay, so uh, now let's look at the, um, okay. We, we actually see, already see lots of articles about the history of the 1918 influenza uh, in the media uh, for popular readership. And, and most of them are actually written by professional historians. And, uh, and also articles about other pandemics as well uh, in the media because of the COVID-19. And this search of interest in past pandemic is actually a sign of people's anxieties, you know, and their eagerness to look for lessons, uh, you know, of past pandemic like we do here now. And I, 
and um, similarly, similarly, actually, uh, when SARS broke out in 2003, almost two decades ago, huh, it also sparked a drastic spike of uh, kind of like popular interest huh, in clock history or pa um, pandemic history, uh, as people were really, you know, trying to look for historical uh, lesson to make sense of SARS. And even historians too, they were inspired to write, uh, to, to find out more about past pandemic. Like uh, the, the person actually uh, really had done a lot of research in, uh, in, in the 1918 influenza in British Malaya is actually a scholar called Liu Kai Kun. He is a Singaporean. Okay, but uh, he's not doing uh, history anymore at, the, at this moment. He's more uh, doing uh, cultural studies. But uh, back then, uh, in 2007, he, he wrote this a piece called uh, the, the, the 1918 Influenza in, in British Malaysia. And I believe the piece that uh, another panelist of this uh, webinar, uh, Francis Giallogo, he has written a piece on um, the 1918 Influenza as well, back in 2009, right? I, I'm not sure, I haven't talked to Francis about this. Uh, I hope that he would tell us whether this was also actually sparked by uh, the past you know, the, 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 uh, the H1N1 avian flu back in 2008-2009 because it was written in 2009. Yeah? Or was it also related to his interest in SARS back in 2003? Uh, was it, or was it the, the, uh, inspired by all these uh, present time kind of a pandemic? Yeah? So over the course of almost about a decade uh, from 2003 to 2020, uh, uh, 12 and 13, uh, you can see that in, in China, Singapore, and Malaysia, there was this search of interest to dig up stories of past pandemic. And uh, so people uh, started to search uh, for this past pandemic in China, and they uh, stumbled upon the story of this so-called Manchurian plot in Northeast China. And a plot fighter whose name is called Wu Liente. And this Wu, Wu Liente, you can see from uh, the, the PowerPoint here, uh, this guy looking into a microscope, his name is Wu Liente, and uh, he is actually born in Penang, but trained in Cambridge, but then later joined, um, back then it was the nationalist government in China, to uh, handle Manchurian plot, which broke out in 1910 uh, to 1911. So it's even earlier than the 1918 influenza, but it was a key moment in China in the sense that uh, this Manchurian plot um, laid out the so-called modern, quote unquote, modern public health infrastructure uh, in China. That's why uh, he has been, Wu Lente has been canonized as so-called uh, the father of uh, modern public health in China. Something like that. Okay. So uh, since then, since then, since this uh, interest in searching for uh, past pandemia, the internet was actually flooded with a lot of articles uh, and about about Manchurian plot. Um, and then the narrative of this um, this wave of interest in history. Yeah? You can see that the narrative is always state centric triumphalist, that means it's always praising the success of uh, 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 the, 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 the Chinese government uh, uh, in handling Manchurian plot. Uh? And also, um, like I mentioned before, you know, the canonize of Wu Liente as a, in, in a, a kind of great doctor trope kind of narrative, okay? So uh, in this way of searching a past pandemic, uh, in, in, instead of drawing lesson from the past, uh, actually the Chinese authorities uh, was actually using or retelling this past as an instrument to shape the narrative of SARS in 2003. Okay, and, and, and they construct Wu Liente as a patriotic hero. Patriotism in this context is very interesting because like I mentioned, he was actually born in Penang and he's actually, he was actually a Malayan, not a, a, a Chinese national. Uh, and, and Wu Liente actually fled China and returned to Malaya after Sino-Japan War broke out in 1937. So why? Why did uh, the narrative, you know, uh, kind of like frame in heroism and patriotism? Huh? It's because this his heroic story of Wu Liente is very useful. The Chinese government actually use it 
apart from shifting the narrative of SARS, it was all, the, the, the authority was also using it as a tool for disciplining medical doctors in China and shifting a kind of medical patriotism in China. So the, the, the ultimate, you can say that the ultimate um, purpose of all this heroic narrative of Wu Lian is trying to divert popular attention away from questioning the government's, the Chinese government's responsibility, role, and performance in handling SARS outbreak. That, that, that was, that's my observation, but of course, maybe other people, other scholars might disagree with my observation. So you can see that now this uh, search of um, interest in fighting past pandemic in China, today it has become a history of fighting historical lesson. Okay, or to be more precise, a history of how the Chinese government instrumentalized past pandemic. Okay, now let's move back to Southeast Asia where we are. Okay, uh, Singapore was actually one of the most country um, most impacted by SARS back then. Uh, Singapore too was interested in past pandemic. Okay, and, and you can see that Liu Kai Kun's work in 2007, the piece on 1918 influenza came out of this as well. But Kai Kun was actually very critical of Singapore government back then, you know, critical of Singapore government's use of uh, uh, like uh, framing SARS, you know, as a, a, a success of a Singaporean government's uh, battling a, a pandemic. Okay, so it was framed in a, a so-called state-centric triumphalist narrative as well. And Kai Kun was actually trying to use his writing of 1918 influenza to criticize the Singapore government. Okay, but uh, what about the role, the place of this Wu Lian-Tay's story? Huh? Why, why, what does Wu Lian-Tay has anything to do with Singapore? Uh, it turns out that actually Wu Lian-Tay's daughter was based in uh, Singapore back then. So as China was interested in, in finding the, the history of uh, Manchuria plot and, and discover, rediscover the legacy of Wu Lian-Tay, so they reached out to Wu Lian-Tay's daughter to discover more about Wu Lian-Tay's uh, Lian life. So in that sense, Singapore too uh, played uh, a, a significant uh, note. It was, a, it was an important note uh, in, in the region that produced narrative about Wu Lian-Tay. Uh. And, and the same narrative is like, uh, is always about uh, the triumph of the state overcoming uh, a very challenging uh, pandemic, uh, epidemic, huh? okay? And, uh, and added with more personal touch because it was told by uh, Wu Lian-Tay's daughter. Huh? And now move again a little bit north to Malaysia, okay? In contrast to the experience in China and Singapore, Malaysia's interest in Wu Lian-Tay okay, actually was driven, largely driven by interest in tourism. Why? Because uh, around 2008, 2008 Georgetown, um, the capital of uh, Penang, uh, was awarded UNESCO World Heritage status. And then this sparked interest in uh, the general public, you know, the, the, the general public, Penang people began to take interest in local history uh, and then uh, they encountered the stories of Wu Lian Tay online, internet, okay, because Singapore and, and China have already produced a lot of these stories of uh, Manchurian flood and, and Wu Lian Tay. So Penang people, as they search for uh, more stories about Penang, they discover Wu Lian Tay's story. And then why, what, what Wu Lian Tay has anything to do with Penang? Just because he was actually born in Penang. Okay, that's how he came uh, to be related to all these uh, heritage uh, discourse uh, about uh, heritage story about uh, Penang. Okay, and um, even though um, Ulente's legacy, medical legacy, public health less legacy, legacy actually is in China, he hardly has none, done anything in uh, Mal uh, Malaya. Uh, after returning from China back to Malaya, he, he actually practiced just as a general practitioner uh, in a small town called Ipoh, okay? So interestingly, interestingly, in the present COVID-19 pandemic, stories of Wu Liente resurfaced, re-emerged. And then this time, Malaysians, they proudly make the claim that, you know, surgical mask is an invention by Malaysia, which is not untrue because it was actually Wu Liente, who the first person to use mask 
as a prevention method against the uh, the plaque. Okay, it was it was his invention. But Wu Liante was never a Malaysian, right? He was a Malaysian. Okay, but then you can see that now Malaysian are kind of like claiming uh, these surgical masks as an invention of uh, Malaysian uh, by Malaysian. It's a Malaysian legacy, a contribution to the world today. Okay, so these are the cases of past, uh, sorry, uh, of post SARS search for pandemic history. And then they show that people are appropriating knowledge of past pandemic. Uh, pandemic for purposes and not really directly related or even unrelated uh, to managing present pandemic. For example, in, in China, knowledge of Uliente was used for disciplining medical workers, you know, cultivating medical patriotism and divert attention away from interrogating the state's responsibility. In other words, uh, the Chinese government was using it to ma manage and manipulate popular opinion so that people won't question the government's performance. And uh, in the present pandemic uh, in Malaysia, knowledge of past pandemic is actually used for claiming ownership. It's like telling the world, this piece of uh, fabric uh, is a PPE, personal protective equipment, uh, fundamental for this prevention. Uh, it's actually a contribution from Malaysia. In a nutshell, uh, presentism is in play. Okay, People are interpreting history for their present needs, which is not necessarily relevant to managing uh, the pandemic, which is... Uh, so it, what is even uh, interesting is this version, the, all these stories might not really reflect what's actually happening in the past because it, it, is, it has been appropriated to serve the needs of the present. Huh? Yeah, so uh, these are some of the photos of uh, the Manchurian plaque and then on the right hand side you can see that this is the portrait of uh, Wu Liante. Huh? And this photo, uh, you can see that these are um, medical workers wearing masks in the 1910-1911 Manchurian plant. Huh? And back then, there was no industrial mass production of masks yet. So these are just handmade masks. You can see, uh, you know, the fabric, uh, it, it, they were it, like very handy kind of a mask, not, not, not the mass pro industrial mass product, uh, pro produced masks. Huh? Okay, now I'm moving to the uh, second part of my talk. Uh, uh, is question about can past pandemic really offer lesson for managing the present pandemic or uh, in other words can historians show the value of history for policy making okay there is already a conversation out there on whether history can offer lessons for managing present pan uh, pandemic or no the answers are actually both yes and no okay for example uh a historian like Frank Snowden, uh, who wrote, who, who just published this book called Academic and Society last year, 2019. Uh, and, and another scholar, his name is called David S. Jones. Uh, he, he, he just penned a, a piece in, I think in April or March, I can't remember, uh, talk about history in a crisis and, and trying to uh, derive lessons from past pandemic huh? but there are other scholars who disagree with the idea that you know history can really offer lessons for the present for example uh, Hong Kong University uh, historian Robert Peckham he even um, suggests that historians should take an anti-lesson stance you know should, should try to Re uh, to reject the temptation of trying to use history to for the um, uh, kind of like trying to project future, okay, uh, or to predict, okay, uh, more precisely to predict what's going to happen in the future. He refused to take stand. He he argued for a anti-lesson stance, huh? and there are other. Uh, two French scholars, uh, they, they claim that no, you know, uh, history has no lessons. But regardless, the idea that history offers lessons has actually uh, has several assumptions. Uh. The first assumption behind the idea of uh, uh, history as lesson uh, is that uh, there, there is this universal truth about how societies re respond to contagious disease. Okay, and this we can find this kind of uh, this idea in, in uh, Charles Rosenberg's work. Uh, his work was inspired by Camus, uh, Albert Camus' 
work on, on, on the, the pestilence. Huh? And, and he came up with this idea that, you know, for every pandemic, each pandemic, huh? as the pandemic unfolds, huh? there is this social drama unfolding. And this social drama uh, can be categorized into three acts or three phases. Okay, he came up with this idea. And, and Frank Snowden too, he came up with a very kind of like very general idea that, you know, every society produces its own specific vulnerabilities. As he was talking about epidemic, he was suggesting, um, promote, uh, proposing the idea that, you know, uh, epidemic actually reveals what a society is. Okay, uh, all the strengths and weaknesses of a society, of pre-existing social, cultural, economy, and political conditions in a society. Okay, and these are kind of a very general idea of so-called uh, history as lesson. Uh, and we already see that people are comparing the present pandemic uh, with SARS, which was 20 years ago. And also, of course, uh, now a lot of people are talking about 1918 influenza. So people are comparing already. Uh, and then another assumption behind this idea, underlying this idea of history as lessons, is uh, the assumption that different epidemics are structurally comparable. Robert Peckham criticized it. He said that this is a myth. No, no two pandemics can be structurally, uh, structurally comparable because especially when pandemics happen like a century apart, the social condition, historical context can be completely different. So how can you compare? How can you draw a lesson from past, right? So uh, there is this, according to him, there is this danger of stressing, you know, an analogy or drawing similarities between academics. It can be, uh, it, it, it can end up like uh, selective attention when, when we are drawing uh, similarities uh, between uh, different pandemics. And uh, also there is a, a, a pro a pro another myth is about, you know, we can always find causal relations between events, you know, this event result in uh, another event, this kind of a causal relations. And usually these are, these are, this kind of thinking actually are, or we usually come from social scientists, especially with, with certain paradigm. Uh, uh, it doesn't work, but history doesn't work that way la, for, for a scholar like uh, Robert Peckham. Eh? In, in his mind, uh, history doesn't work that way. Okay, his, history is very complicated. Eh? And now let's turn to look at, um, you know, the historical context of the two pandemics a century apart. Uh, of course, I'm talking about uh, the pandemic, 1918 influenza in British Malaya and COVID-19 as I see it today in Malaysia, okay? We can actually draw two lists. One list, I would call it a list of recurring themes or a list of similarities between these two pandemics. And another list would be a list of differences. So what can we see on the list of similar? What I can see from, from the, this list of similarity is, first is, yes, there was this uh, practice of social distancing and people were wearing masks in 1918, uh, influenza. Uh, and people's lives were affected by human responses to pandemic, especially the closing down of schools, cinemas, and then uh, um, you know, the, the uh, industrial work, they, they just stopped. You know, people just need to stop and these are affecting people's lives. And then uh, a, a third recurring theme would be uh, the tension between individual liberties and collective wellness. There's always this tension, you know, whether people should give up their individual freedom and right in, in the moment of pandemic, uh, you know, for the sake of protecting collective wellness. Okay. And then the fourth theme uh, that I have observed is the desire to always assign responsibility. Okay, the desire to, to, to assign a response, responsibility. And then this always targeting the most marginalized group in the society or exploit the existing social division. Okay, uh, people are blaming scapegoating, you know, migrants as the uh, people who are, uh, as those who bring in diseases. Okay, so back in 1918, who was blamed for bringing the diseases? It was the 
um, you know, uh, South Asian and Chinese, the coolie, Indian coolie and the Chinese coolie. Yeah? They were blamed for bringing the, 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 the disease. And today, what I see in Malaysia is that we are still blaming migrants. But this group of migrants now is uh, mostly uh, uh, from, from South, South Asia. Okay, so this is kind of like something that is unchanged. And then, so migrant life huh, in the past and, and today, there seems to be little change, little change in, in terms of migrant lives. Huh? They are still being scapegoated as a, a pathogenic bringing disease. Huh? And even the uh, death rate, but in terms of death rate, of course, today um, Malaysia is much better. Uh, among the, the, the death case, cases, only very few are migrant. But in terms of infection, uh, in fact, positive cases, um, migrants consist of a, it's part of the significant uh, population eh, that, that, that is found uh, positive. Okay. And uh, another thing that is recurring is the production of meaning around the outbreak, around uh, this uh, uh, virus. Eh? People are trying to generate, uh, people generate metaphors, you know, uh, using elements of the time, you know. So in the past, people are generating metaphors as well. And then today, people are doing the same thing, trying to uh, make sense of uh, uh, the outbreak or trying to cope with all the stress that uh, uh, that is related to, to the outbreak. Yeah? Uh, and But of course, there are a lot of differences, which is not comparable at all. Oh, so uh, the, the one of the, the differences is, you know, in the past, the, the colonial authority, they were so reluctant to take greater responsibility to provide universal health care. Unlike today, uh, at least, uh, Malaysia's government uh, uh, provide universal health. But of course, this universal health doesn't cover uh, the needs of um, migrant workers. Okay, this is a completely another di different issue. But in terms of its own citizens, people have universal access uh, to, to, to medicine. Huh? And so, uh, in, in British, during British time, uh, there was this reliance on community contribution, community uh, health care. Uh, like most of the hospitals back then were, were, were actually built by um, the community. I mean, the, the Asian communities. Okay, rather, usually the rich businessmen coming from different ethnic groups, they, they were supposed to donate and, and build hospitals. I think uh, Ravando has mentioned this in one of the home sea conference as well. Huh? He presented a paper on that as well. So the situation, uh, Indonesia also had this kind of community, kind of charity hospital as well, and, and the same in Malaysia. And uh, there was a, and the presence of civil society. Of course, all these uh, community charity uh, is a part of uh, civil society. But today we have a different type of civil society, which you, you see individual, Individuals and activists, you know, they, they are very active in helping out each other. So you have people going out to give food to the homeless or, or uh, the urban poor. Okay. And uh, predictability is another thing uh, that's very different. Back then, life was so much more unpredictable than today. And today, today people are, uh, the life of people huh, is so much comfortable than, than in the past. But of course, uh, for, for migrants, it probably didn't change much, the past and present, huh? uh, except that, except that uh, probably different industries, working in different industries. But in terms of predictability, uh, the life is so much predictable today. And there was no popular electoral politics during 1918. Colonial, colonial power was uh, unchecked, uh, but then the, the current pandemic, we have a different political situation. The government needs to respond to popular needs. Okay, so you can see that the government in Malaysia, you know, is trying to uh, and, and respond to this. And some more, you know, uh, in February, we just, in, in March, early March, we just have a change of government or so-called political coup. Okay, another part, uh, these, these uh, elites, uh, they, are, they are competing against each other. And then so, so the, the new government is really trying to uh, win the hearts and minds of people. Because locking down has a lot of negative impact. And this is what we didn't see back in 1918, because colonial government doesn't need to respond to popular 
demand or expectation relatively you know uh, it was very different and uh, medical technology and knowledge is also very different the way we understand disease today you know we have uh, a lot more complicated technology to uh, to 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 uh, to study viruses or bacteria or whatever okay so the technology is very different uh, from a century ago and global interconnectedness today's global economy is even more integrated than a century ago the rise of for example the rise of tourism and aviation aviation industry it, it is unimaginable in 100 years ago but today tourism is one of the most in affected industry the, how many uh, aviation industry is almost dead now if the, the, this pandemic lasts longer, the aviation industry, many, many of the industrial players, they might just die, you know, uh, they, they, they won't survive this uh, pandemic. And, and a lot of people got it's affected, they, they are affected, okay, they, they become jobless because of this. But uh, back then, uh, different, huh? But of course, uh, we have global, this uh, internet, so we have online trade, uh, this may, might compensate a bit, you know, uh, people can probably change their job, but I, I, I don't think it's going to change, uh, really have much uh, impact. Huh? Uh, so, uh, so, um, so the society remains full of inequality and internet, back then there was no internet, there was no internet. So uh, locking down and self-isolation, self-quarantine back then and today has completely different meaning. Okay, so these are the differences that um, I can see. Uh, I think that's what I have to say for my talk today. Uh, yeah, am I taking too much time? I will end my part here, my, my, my presentation here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Poor. Okay, I'll stop share. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Poor. Um, sorry. Before we proceed, uh, allow me to introduce myself. I am uh, Ferdinand Victoria, and uh, I will be moderating the uh, session for today. Um, but uh, before we, um, you know, uh, introduce the second speaker, let me just uh, read off uh, certain participation guidelines for participants. Um, if you have comments, or uh, in order for us to, you know, make the um, proceedings. Uh, um, go smoothly. Uh, number one, please address your comments or questions to the speakers uh, at any time during the public chat space. So there's a chat space, there's a Q&A section there, you can please type your questions there. Um, only the speakers will be allowed to use their microphone, as you may have noticed. Um, when you type your question, please kindly introduce yourselves, uh, telling us your full name and uh, the country where you're coming from. Uh, also, uh, please kindly state the, um, the name of the person whom you are directing the query. So um, is it Dr. Poor, Dr. Ghani, or Dr. Francis, or Dr. Gialgo? Uh, maybe you can uh, write the names. And then um, as much as possible, keep the question brief and straight to the point. And also, uh, lastly, please note that this seminar will be recorded and that you will be able to watch it later. Um, the video is being shown live right now at the Facebook page of the De La Salle University Southeast Asia Research Hub uh, Center and Hub. And uh, I think it will be re-posted um, there. Um, kapada pasarta pasarta, yeah, uh, sup supaya um, uh, webinar kita akan lancar. Uh, ini beberapa peraturan. Uh, kalau ada komen atau pertanyaan kepada speaker-speaker, uh, silakan menggunakan chat. Uh, terus uh, sebelum um, mengetik pertanyaannya, tolong um, uh, mohon uh, perkenalkan diri dan negaranya da dari, dari negara ma mana dan uh, tolong juga tulis uh, uh, nama speaker kepada uh, yang uh, ingin uh, anda ingin menjawab uh, terus uh, yang pertanyaannya dijadikan singkat dan to the point aja uh, terus uh, webinar ini akan uh, diputar balik nanti. 
the uh, De La Salle University Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub. Baik. So uh, let's continue with the uh, second speaker. Uh, let me introduce the second speaker for today. <clears throat> Sorry, let me just uh, shift. Our second speaker Our second speaker um, uh, obtained his doctorate degree uh, in history from uh, Ehes Paris with a dissertation entitled The Question of Hygiene in the Dutch East Indies, Issues on Medicine, Culture, and Society, uh, recently, 2017. And he has recently published a book entitled Panyakit Kalamin di Jawa, 1814 to 1942, or The Venereal Disease in Java, 1814 to 1942, uh, just uh, a few years ago, and is a prolific publish uh, and has published in journals and media about the history of medicine. He now teaches history at the Department of History and Philology in Universitas Pajajaran, Bandung, and uh, he is also conducting research on the history of science and medicine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to Dr. Gani Jalyani. Silakan pa. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Freddy. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for participating uh, in this uh, webinar. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Andy Ahdian and Dr. Fernando Santiago for organizing this uh, webinar on pandemics in uh, Southeast Asia. This is an interesting uh, theme to be discussed in this time of uncertainty happening globally. Uh, this is also uh, important that we address our regional context of the Southeast Asia as we share similar experience for many centuries. Okay, let me share the uh, screen first. Okay, can you all see the, the screen in full? Yes, Pat, thank you. So, uh, Dr. Parr has spoken about uh, the possibility of using uh, pandemic history to give the insight on the present day case. It was a very interesting presentation, uh, but different from Dr. Parr, I would like to speak about the history of disease, the epidemics in the colonial time in Indonesia. The, the main idea I would like to present is first that the history of epidemics in Indonesia has always been related to the global history of the disease. Secondly, uh, the question of disease is always the economic politics problem. And lastly, I'd like to discuss to what extent the ignorance of the colonial authority worsens the transmission of the epidemic. The idea of uh, global history of disease, of course, could be read in uh, several books, such as Max Harrison's Contagion, How Commerce Has Spread Disease, published in 2012, or Alfred Crosby's the Colombian exchange, biological and cultural consequence of 1492, uh, published in uh, 1973. I'm not going into the detail in analyzing this book. Suffice it to say that the circulation of people and things uh, is the circulation of disease as well. The history of Black Death in the 19th in the 14th century and cholera in the 19th century is the best example of how the spreading of the disease follows the human route in commerce. This happened to quote Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie because of what he called l'unification microbienne du monde. The, uh, the, what is said, the uh, unification of the global by, by disease. This is uh, an article uh, published in 1973. Uh, that is to say, 
uh, according to him that from the 14th century, people have started to share the same microbe, the same pathogen, the same disease around the world. Indonesian colonial history shows how colonialism bring with them the disease as well. That is to say the arrival of the Europeans led to the appearance of the epidemics. The construction of Batavia, the former, the former name of Jakarta in the 17th century, for example, caused the spread of malaria because the existence of the canals which became the place for mosquitoes to breed. Peter H. found a book in his book, Malaria and Malaise, the VOC in Batavia in the 18th oh, published in uh, 1994, shows that beside the canal construction, which did not respect the nature, the fact that Batavia was close, was a closed city made the air circulated terribly. Moreover, in this work, he put a hypothesis that the fall down of the VOC the first transnational commerce corporation in the late uh, 18th century was caused by the disease. His explanation shows that uh, to what extent the presence of epidemics could change the current of the history. Furthermore, the spread of the syphilis, the sexually uh, transmitted disease, was also caused by the coming of the Europeans. That is why one of the physicians working in North Sumatra in the mid of 19th century said that civilization means civilization, the coming of the Europeans who were considered as the bearers of the civilization was also regarded as the carrier of the disease, the syphilis. A study, a study by uh, another physician on, in the second decade of the 20th century shows that this disease mixed with the habit of drinking alcohol became more dangerous. It attacked the nerve of the patient. This observation uh, reinforced the idea that civilization or the, the contact with the Europeans besides the transmission of the disease could make the disease worse. And that happened a lot to the Europeans and the local aristocrats who followed the the Western uh, lifestyle, such as drinking alcohol. Earlier in the 19th century, the cholera outbreak happened in 1821. The disease came to the Netherlands indeed through Samara, a port city in central Java. From that city, the disease spread across the whole island. The coming of the disease was not, was not without warning, was not without warning. Uh, in 1919, uh, when the disease occurred in Mauritania, Penang, and Malacca, the colonial government was warned about the possibility of the spreading the disease in the Netherlands Indies, as the vessel coming to the Netherlands Indies often made a stop in those places. Uh, nevertheless, the, the colonial government ignored this warning, saying that the temperature in the Netherlands Indies was not possible to develop the disease. The transmission of cholera was accordingly inevitable. The disease touched every social group, but the poor native inhabitants were the most victim because of their lack of nutrition that made them susceptible to the, uh, to the disease. Another example of how colonial government denied the presence of the epidemics was uh, when the epidemic happened in central Java in 1847. Dr. William Borch, who was the chief of military health department, reported that the epidemics related to the implementation of the culture stelso, a system of culture which obliged the local people to cultivate one five of their land, the crops that had economic value in the European market. The system had caused the famine among local people because in practice, it was often that they were obliged to cultivate the whole island with the crops profitable for the global market to sell while they could not cultivate their own crops to be consumed. This fact made them susceptible 
to the transmission of the disease. The fact that the culture style cell was the program of the colonial government that made them rich, they denied that the system had a negative effect. The government tried uh, to give another explanation that the epidemic had nothing to do with the system of culture. It was more caused by the changing of weather and especially because of the eruption of the volcano a supernatural explanation which most local people believe at the time. For that reason, the measures taken by the government were late and the victims of this epidemic were so many. Van Hovel, a rebel thinker and one of the greatest critics to the Calter Stelsel, under a pseudonym Geronimus, published a book titled An Epidemic of Java and the cholera in Netherlands, in which he described that the disease was so deadly that it erased the whole population in the village. The history of the uh, yellow river is another example about how the colonial uh, government did not take precaution to prevent the transmission of the epidemic. The debate was about the necessity to put a quarantine measure in the Netherlands Indies. The story was started when, the, when there was a report about the outbreak of the yellow fever in, again, Mauritania. The chief of the health department at the time, Adam Walskewitz, wrote on a letter dated uh, 29 May 1867, saying that the disease will not spread in Netherlands Indies. Giving a response to the caution of this danger, he said that there was nothing to be worried about. And the advice to create a quarantine station at the port was neglected. Uh, the position for the Marine, Dr. Oden Hoffern, on the other side, didn't share this view. In his opinion, the, the, the establishment of the quarantine was very important to prevent the danger that coming from the outside. However, this advice was ignored by the colonial authority saying that the measure was not necessary to be taken. One of the reason was that the cost of this was too high. And when the plague, when the plague attacked the Holy City Maka in 1874, the colonial authority worry about its spread in the Netherlands Indies, given the fact that there were a lot of its inhabitants who went to that city for the Hajj. Dr. Becking, the chief of the health department at the time, gave a response in a letter dated 6 October 1874, saying that there was nothing to be worried of. According to him, the plague wouldn't spread in the tropics. The outbreak would only happen in the, in the countries with moderate climate because the tropical heat would destroy the carrier of the pathogen. The doctor once more put an emphasis that the quarantine was unnecessary. The debate about the possibility to establish the quarantine to prevent the danger coming from the outside shows two things. On the one hand, the colonial authority ignored the precaution of the danger. On the other hand, this was based on the economics consideration. The quarantine measure at some point could endanger the economic interests of the colonial government. I would like to, uh, to end my presentation by giving a highlight about the great ignorance that the colonial authority did, the flu pandemic in 1918. This pandemic has caused 1.5 million deaths in the Netherlands Indies during a year, year of its transmission. This great number of victims could be avoided if the colonial authority had taken the precaution from the very beginning. This attitude was supported as well by the civil health department, 
saying that the disease was not dangerous. The disease was reported for the first time in June uh, 19, uh, uh, 1918. By the end of June, July, the disease had been uh, not in several parts of Java and Kalimantan. This was the first wave of the disease. The second one began in October. This time, the disease spread across the archipelago until the eastern part of the Netherlands Indies. One of the reasons of the widespread of the disease in the very short time was that the colonial authority didn't take into consideration when the disease was reported for the first time. Moreover, the civil health department did a wrong diagnosis saying that the disease was cholera. The second wave of the disease, the deadly one, was caused by this ignorance which resulted in a degree number of victims. I'm not going into detail about uh, what happened at the time. Suffice to say that uh, once again, ignorance plays a very important part in spreading and worsening the epidemics or the pandemics. And to conclude my presentation, the epidemics in Indonesia at some point was a consequence of the global encounter. The history of epidemics in Indonesia during the colonial period was the history of repeated ignorance. And this ignorance at some point was caused by the tendency to secure the economic interests of the colonial authority. As we are witnessing today, I believe in many, many parts of the world, we are familiar with the similar argument on handling today's pandemic. Terima kasih. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pak Gani, uh, for that wonderful uh, presentation. Um, Let's uh, move on to the third speaker. Uh, by the way, uh, please keep those questions coming. Uh, you may ask them in English, Filipino, or uh, Bahasa. We will de definitely try to convey that to these speakers. Um, lastly, uh, for our third speaker, let me introduce him. Um, he is a professor of history from the Ateneo de Manila University and is the lead convener of Tangol Kasaysayan, uh, which is Defend History, and a regular columnist uh, in the website bulatlat.com with a column entitled Balik Saisay, meaning back to basics or back to history. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me present uh, Dr. Francis Gialogo. Thank you. Maraming salamat, uh, Ferdi. Thanks uh, to the organizers. Uh, of this uh, webinar and I'm honored and uh, glad to be invited. Uh, just like what Thor and Gani mentioned, it's like a reunion of sorts for most of us uh, because we, the, the historical community in Southeast Asia is such a, a small community. So it has always been an opportunity uh, for us to take, just like this one, to meet again. Now, although the circumstances now are, uh, are really different uh, given uh, the restrictions of the pandemic. Uh, so let me share with you my, my presentation. Um, wait. Uh, I will be focusing on the 1903 and nine, to 1905 cholera pandemic and uh, 1918, 1918 influenza pandemic in the Philippines um, uh, as a way of uh, putting forward and foregrounding some of the issues uh, that may come across, uh, that we may come across in analyzing not only the historicity of the experience of uh, 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 social pandemics, as we as historians would call it, but also reflecting on uh, our current situations. And just like most historians, I would like to contextualize these uh, two major um, 
disease events in a larger political, economic, and cultural context. While these are reflecting the, the Philippine context, uh, maybe the experiences already discussed in the Malay Peninsula by Poor and in the Netherlands, uh, East Indies by, by Ghani here, uh, may also be uh, a way of uh, reflecting what the Philippine experience uh, was with regard to this uh, experience. So uh, just to provide us with the context, the Philippines uh, was uh, open to international ports uh, uh, for global commerce with the opening of uh, Sual, Manila, Legaspi, Cebu, Iloilo, Tacloban, Sambuanga. And then the hundreds of local ports in the archipelago made uh, the transmission of these diseases uh, easily experienced. So there, there is an economic side to uh, the uh, facility by the, uh, that paved the way for the ease in the transmission of the disease as early as uh, the opening of the Philippines. Um, and the opening was intensified through the internationalization of cash crop uh, agricultural exports uh, from most of the Philippine countryside. So this majority of the open ports of the country were accessible to foreign vessels. Uh, and by, uh, and con connectedly, uh, riverine commerce uh, made these goods available to the interiors of, of the archipelago. This provided the necessary geographical conditions for the unimpeded spread of cholera and other uh, communicable diseases. So if, if we look at the uh, uh, history of cholera in the Philippines um, and the cholera pandemics that happened in the 19th century, we can easily say that almost every pandemic outbreak would af affect the Philippines with almost decadal regularity. Uh, the Spanish officials tried to affect the quarantine system uh, but the insular characteristics of uh, the colony made it uh, almost uh, impossible. But let me uh, go to the uh, cholera pandemic of 1903 of, of, and up to 1905, uh, which is part, I think, of the uh, history of global pandemics as it affected the 19th century up to the early 20th century. Uh, as I mentioned, it's almost uh, every decade in the Philippines you know, that uh, cholera was a um, constant um, uh, vi uh, uh, visitor um, and the mortality and morbidity uh, experience of the Philippine population was so high that it tempered the population growth of the Philippines during the 19th century. Uh, once a trading port in Asia becomes contaminated, the insular colonial health authorities would almost always attempt to impose a 15-day quarantine system uh, to no avail. Now, of course, these were non, uh, what we call NPI or the non-pharmaceutical um, initiatives no, in containing the disease, but uh, this would creep into the open parts of the country and spread inland. No. Aside from international commerce, local vendors selling fruits, vegetables, and cooked food to almost every Pueblo market were also to to be found. The colonial authorities tried to regulate the sale and consumption of food items, but this became a matter of survival for the majority of the, Philipp of the Philippine population. So whether they would be allowed to eat uh, food being sold in the streets uh, so that they will not hungry, but run the risk of, uh, the dis of being sick with the disease, or uh, don't eat at all so that they will not be contaminated and uh, be sick. Um, the 1902-1905 outbreak was one of the most virulent in the history of the cholera uh, epidemic in the Philippines, coming at the time when the archipelago was being subjected to American occupation with disastrous consequences. For those who are familiar with Philippine history, this was the second phase of the Filipino-American war and the guerrilla warfare was going on, um, resisting uh, against American occupation. And to contain Filipino resistance, American authorities created concentration camp by virtue of the reconcentration law. 
um, entered in previously isolated communities and created conditions for the local population to seek refuge in other uh, areas to escape the war and also to escape the epidemic. All this created, unfortunately, the, the conditions for the spread of cholera. The concentration camps became breeding ground for the spread of cholera, escaping population and pursuing American troops brought with them the cholera virus. There was a total breakdown in sanitation and food production provided and that uh, provided the conditions uh, uh, even worse. No? There were also some controversial measures undertaken by the Americans. No? For example, with the Farola or Lighthouse District in Manila, a known urban poor community, uh, cholera spread to other parts of the country during this period. The Americans reacted by burning all the settlements, creating adverse reaction from the local population. But the houses of the rich were spared, creating a perception that the Americans were burning the villages of the poor and the anti-cholera measure was an anti-poor measure uh, against those who were resisting American occupation in order to give the land to the rich who were by then shifting allegiances to, to the Americans. So the differences in the materials used in the house construction between the rich and the poor was mistakenly identified as one of the factors in the spread of cholera. Uh, touched uh, roof houses were the how common houses mat of materials used by the, by the poor while the rich uh, had stone and uh, hardwood houses. This created further divide, class divide among the population during the war. Uh, and the war against cholera. And in order to contain the cholera, the Americans also tried to restrict the trade in the cities. Combined with the concentration camps in most farm communities, uh, farming conditions set in uh, and, uh, cre and created the condition for the smuggling of contaminated food uh, that eventually became rampant. Again, the war became a war of perceptions. The popular perception was that the famine was caused by the Americans trying to kill the Filipinos by hunger. It became a choice of whether the Filipinos would die of cholera or would die of hunger or would be a casualty of the war. Uh, and in and, and, and any which way, it would be tragic to most of the Filipinos. Uh, there was also a number of captured Filipinos who were put into uh, cramped jail facilities, making them vulnerable to uh, cholera during the, any outbreak. And actually the prisons uh, became epicenters of all of these outbreaks uh, during this period. Now, at the time of the concentration camps and food blockade imposed by the Americans to fight the resistance, there was also the, the policy of forced hospital, hospitalization for cholera victims. Uh, usually the sick will be in their advanced state of illness uh, creating parallel uh, pre uh, a, a parallel prison population in the, in the hospitals. The Americans blamed the unsanitary practices of the Filipinos for the spread of the disease. Well, I think this, is also, this was also mentioned by Ghani in the case of the Indonesians uh, under the Dutch. With the draconian measures like burning of the villages, forced evacuation and establishment of concentration camps not only as a means to combat cholera, but also to control the population during the war. So the, the, the American sanitary order came at a time when American military and political order was being imposed, creating parallel programs of containment, surveillance, building alliances with the elite and containing popular resistance. So it was a case of sanitary order in the Pueblo as a being projected as a colonial project. Uh, in contrast with the uh, perception and the presentation of the disorderly, subversive, and uncontrollable resistance communities teeming with diseases and restlessness among the Filipino population. So let's go to the Philippines in the world of the 1918 and 1919 influenza pandemic. You know, there was a great deal of otherness uh, in this pandemic. You know. It was mistakenly called Spanish influenza because Spain at the time, um, coming at the end of the First World War, was a neutral power and uh, was reporting all of these uh, diseases as they 
were being experienced by the population, the other uh, combatant nations were censoring the transmission of news about the disease, fearing that they, this would weaken their position in the war. So it was uh, mistaken as uh, Spanish influenza uh, in most countries, but in Spain, it was called French flu. It was uh, chunking fever in France, Flanders grip uh, called uh, by the British, Blitz Qatar by the Germans, pointing to its supposed uh, Russian or German influence uh, from the, uh, but I, I, I've heard it in the Malay Peninsula, the Malays called it the Chinese or the Caucasian fever. Well, the Singaporeans were call it, calling the Singapore and Chinese were calling it the Chinese or uh, the, the Caucasian fever. So there was uh, uh, the regard that it was a fever of war, but it's not our disease, it's their disease. There was a great deal of otherness in this. Uh, but as uh, Ghani mentioned, the influenza pandemic came in waves. If the cholera epidemic came in cycles, uh, in almost uh, decadal regularity, the influenza pandemic uh, came in waves. Uh, but unfortunately, the first wave was hardly noticeable because it was not considered a reportable disease by the health authorities. Uh, just like uh, in the case of uh, Java, it was only reported uh, by the authorities in Manila starting in May and June. By the October and December wave, it became more virulent. No? Uh, and uh, there were particular characteristics no? for the May, June, October, December, and February, March waves of this epidemic. You know? o officially, but at the same time, what's peculiar in the Philippines was that despite the seeming otherness or othering by the uh, other societies in referring to this disease, officially, uh, the, the colonial officials in the Philippines called it, well, autochthonous. It's really a Filipino disease. <laughs> it's a Filipino trangaso. No, uh, it claimed officially around 90,000 victims with a case morbidity rate of around 45 to 55% of the population. So you can see in the graph, in, in the table that, you know, it's really the second wave, just like uh, the Indonesian case that made it more virulent. You know? uh, the November and December wave exhibited the worst rates for this. You know? And if we plot it in the, in the map, we can see that the first wave affected uh, um, uh, Manila and the and, uh, nearby provinces. But for the second wave, it spread uh, in other, th second and third wave, it spread in other provinces. No? There, there was also a uh, noticeable underreporting in some regions. If you look at the map, Mindanao and Cordillera seem to be very white. Uh, it seemed like they do not have the experience at all. But my suspicion is that given that there were many na narratives also coming from these regions about the, the pandemic, uh, the, the authorities were not really that uh, keen in reporting no, uh, the disease in some regions. So there was a great deal of underreporting. So my suspicion is that the 90,000 case mortality rate may, may really be very, very underreported. And, and, and I will come to this later on. Uh, one must also take into consideration the age group of the, of the majority of the victims. Uh, uh, and, What's peculiar in the 1918 influenza pandemic was that unlike in other pandemics, particularly cholera and, and, and smallpox, the 1918 influenza pandemic uh, affected not the very old nor the very young, but the able-bodied young adult population under uh, 40 years old. Uh, some observations, uh, because of the disease, uh, grave diggers were in short supply for most of the affected areas. Medical doctors and practitioners who were considered frontliners were themselves affected. Even the acting director of uh, public health, Vicente de Jesus, the first Filipino director, uh, the uh, famous, uh, the, the father of the famous uh, Filipino poet, Tuseng Batute, Jose Corazon de Jesus, himself fell, fell ill. 
farm workers also failed to harvest uh, their crops and laborers failed to report to work. So there was a great deal of economic consequences also as a result of the pandemic. And also uh, most of the confined populations became the epicenters, uh, prisons, the military camps, the leper colonies, even the universities, no? uh, the government offices, the schools, the cockpit arenas and postal services were all also disrupted. I would like to point the, the a note on the Camp Claudio military training camp uh, because, because of the First World War, some of the uh, Filipino uh, members of the Philippine National Guards were recruited from all over the archipelago for training in Camp Claudio in Pasay, near south of Manila. But because of the end of the war, they were not uh, 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 given the chance to, uh, to uh, serve in Europe and they were sent home you know, un unwittingly and unknowingly. Some of them were already contaminated and therefore uh, creating uh, conditions also for the, the spread of the disease once these guards uh, were sent home back to the provinces. Uh, so there was uh, isolation, disinfection, and the closure of public uh, uh, spaces. Uh, so uh, how, how do we conclude then? Um, the Philippines and the world of pandemics should really be uh, narrativized as a, the Philippines at war uh, with diseases. There were multiple discourses and many narratives you know, coming from the different experiences uh, provided by ethnic differentiation, class differentiation. There were discordant perceptions about who were benefiting, who were uh, being victimized by the war. Uh, colonialism, medicine, and science intersected with nationalism and resistance, especially during the cholera pandemic. No? Uh, and there was also a debate between heredity and race no? uh, of uh, othering the disease or uh, uh, the disease being uh, linked with a particular nationality. Uh, and therefore, the debate between um, some groups of people having the genetic makeup or uh, being um, uh, some of the diseases being uh, inherited or their body conditions having a, a greater capability to withstand or resist the disease or uh, was it uh, caused by the environment and the eco ecology so the debate between hereditarianism and contagionism was a continuing debate uh, and that it was realized during this, this period. Uh, there were also some problems, no? mass, mass resignations of some uh, government doctors, some reassignments of medical personnel for the war efforts, realignment of administrative positions, uh, policy differences regarding the Filipino uh, Filipinization program. Uh, the Filipino doctors were being criticized by American doctors for mishandling the the, in, the, the, the pandemic and the uh, limitations in communication and in, in information gathering, which was very crucial. Uh, there, were all, there was also an observed low prioritization, low budgetary uh, allocation and low salary of medical personnel, bringing to the fore the idea of whether health and rights and class, health and human rights should also be uh, given into account. No? Uh, I think this was also raised by Dr. Poor, uh, whether individual uh, rights should be observed versus the collective public health conditions, or can we uh, as a society uh, attain both? No? Um, take care of individual patients while maintaining the individual rights uh, at the same time, being concerned with the public health measures as public health concerns. Uh, also, the, the, the very visible class divide you know, in society of having access to information, having access to medical health care, having access to facilities during times of peace and times of, of war. So these are, are uh, some of my conclusions and perhaps during the discussion, we can also look at that. Um, and for further reading, uh, Dr. Victoria al already mentioned my Balik Sai column. Perhaps you can also look at this. 
a little self-promotion. And these are some of my sources. Okay. Maraming salamat. Um, thank you. Um, and have a nice day. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gialgo, um, for that uh, informative talk. Um, now we proceed to the um, reactors. Okay, uh, there will be two reactors uh, that will comprise this uh, panel. Um, our first reactor would be um, would be uh, Dr. Luisa Kamagay, uh, who obtained her doctorate from the from ES from the School of Higher Studies in the Social Sciences in Paris, and she is currently the president of the Philippine Historical Association and professor emeritus at the Department of History at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Uh, our second uh, reactor is Mr. Ravando Lee, who received his uh, history bachelor's in history from the Universitas Gadanada and uh, the Leiden University, uh, uh, in uh, where he got his master on global and colonial history. He is currently uh, taking his doctorate at the uh, School of Historical and Philosophical Studies at the uh, Uni University of Melbourne. And uh, his current study, he is currently studying or uh, examining Ch the Chinese Indonesian newspaper called Sinpo uh, to explore political movement and transnational connection of Chinese Indonesian society in the Dutch East Indies. Although he does have a very strong interest in the history of medicine and of sport. Uh, in fact, he is also about to publish his third book on the 1918 influenza pandemic in Indonesia. Uh, so let me introduce, uh, so uh, uh, may, uh, may uh, the reaction will start. Uh, may I ask uh, Professor Kamagai to uh, st start the ball rolling. Thank you. Uh, and please uh, kindly uh, show, uh, send those questions in. You may send them in Bahasa, English, or Filipino. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, yeah, please. Okay. Uh, I'm, I really am overwhelmed with all the information that we got from the three speakers. Uh, but it's interesting that we are focusing on this issue of uh, uh, the pandemic and um, history really has a role to play because uh, it uh, makes us look at the past and see what has been the experience of Asians to this uh, phenomenon? And um, I noticed that one of the things which threads all the three speakers will be the fact that these epidemics occurred during the colonial periods of either Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. So, um, uh, I think it is about time that we Asians look at it ourselves uh, because uh, I feel that, uh, of course, it's a very um, a biased kind of uh, rendition or interpretation because uh, when we look at the experiences of Indonesia under the Dutch or Malaysia under the British and the Philippines under both Spain and the United States, there's that notion of, um, I feel, of us Asians being dirty, quote unquote. And all these diseases are due to the fact that we are not clean. Uh, we don't have hygienic uh, practices. There's a problem of sanitation, et cetera, disposal of waste. So um, uh, that's how they uh, viewed us. And it's about time that we take a look at ourselves because there's so many cultural aspects uh, related to uh, disease and its transmission. So when, uh, for example, in the Philippines, they were burning houses because they believe that this will remove uh, the germs uh, because the germs they believe was called, uh, was coming from miasma 
so the best thing is to burn houses, uh, which for Filipinos, that was really unacceptable. Or the fact that you quarantine people, that's also unacceptable. Or you uh, do reconcentration. So I think uh, now we should take a look at these epidemics from our own point of view, uh, sensitive to the cultural uh, dimensions of the disease. Uh, one thread also, I think that we should uh, uh, see, not only because of the fact that they were all appearing during the colonial period of our respective countries, is also the, um, uh, the level of knowledge about disease. Uh, during these times, uh, because before disease was believed to uh, be caused by miasma until you had the germ fear, etc. So I think uh, they were also groping. They didn't know what this disease was. Of course, cholera, they had some notion of it being a waterborne disease. But very interestingly, as you will, as uh, the speaker spoke, this disease was coming through trade, reaching ports. That's why uh, I noticed for the cholera uh, epidemics that there was, from the point of view of the Spanish colonial authorities and even probably the Americans, there was always the, um, the coming out of bulletins about the state of uh, the port. That's why here in the Philippines, we had a corridor because that was supposed to be the quarantine place. All ships coming in to Manila should stay for a few days in corridor. So there was uh, that kind of notion that um, uh, they had now the idea, they were coming out with the idea that there should be quarantine and that the port should be clean. Uh, I remember the Spaniards were really very sensitive about outbreaks of cholera in the Philippines because it gave the notion that their ports are dirty. Again, the notion of dirty being really uh, the cause of uh, disease. So I think uh, that uh, I, is very, I mean, this should be a start that we should take a look at this disease from our point of view and the um, sensitive to uh, cultural uh, practices of our respective countries. So uh, that's my reaction, but I'm very thankful for the three speakers. You gave us uh, a lot of information about uh, the epidemics. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kamagay. Uh, pa Ravando, silakan. Uh, terima kasih banyak, uh, Mas Ferdi. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the uh, opportunity and good evening, everyone. It's really a great honor to be involved in this excellent webinar. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Andy and Dr. Fernando, for initiating this webinar. I also have like several slides that I'd like to show you. So let me check. Yep. And thank you also for all the three presenters. Uh, and Professor Kamagai, uh, who have given us uh, like vital information about the importance of the story of pandemics and how it is entirely relevant to the current situation when we have to deal with the COVID-19. Uh, times keep moving, but infectious illnesses continue to threaten uh, human populations. And although many virologists and bacteriologists had already warned us that there uh, was always a risk of some unexpected emergence of a new and fatal contagious disease. It seems many of us don't really learn from our past. And history has revealed that epidemics caused by transmissible diseases are not new, uh, spanning from smallpox to Ebola and cholera to HIV. And pandemics are also not a new phenomenon. Uh, several well-known cases can be given as already stated by, by, by several uh, uh, speakers like the 14th century of bubonic, bubonic clock uh, or the Black Death, uh, the 1918 Spanish influenza, uh, and the 2003 outbreak of SARS. And the 
uh, recent uh, COVID-19 outbreak also creates some kind of like a sense of deja vu. Uh, to some extent, parallels can be drawn with the influenza pandemic of 1918. And the Spanish flu 1918, as mentioned by Professor Biologo, was one of the deadliest diseases in human history. It followed patterns of human flow. Uh, the influenza virus arrived with the, with the, uh, with the demobilized uh, troops during World War I. And over the past two centuries, uh, the human movement has expanded to include uh, rapid transport via both land and air. And the development of steam engines in, in the early 20th century and the, and the adoption of this uh, diesel engine dramatically enhanced the movement of people across the region. And the increased movement was not without risk, at, as it was also accompanied by the increased mobility of diseases across borders. And for diseases with human carrier like COVID-19, uh, modern transportation means more expeditious and more extensive transmission than was ever possible in the past. However, unlike in earlier pandemic, our modern medical treatment and monitoring are both far more superior, lessening contagion and mortality, but still, in this recent COVID pandemic, many historians and epi epidemiologists have witnessed a comparable pattern with epidemics in the past. Uh, government's failure to respond adequately, lack of preparedness and mitigation, stigmatization and propaganda were just several examples of it. When influenza struck Southeast Asia in 1918, uh, different countries responded in different ways. Uh, states that implemented early and long duration interventions, including school closures, prohibitions on the public meeting, and other forms of isolation quarantine had far better mortality yeah. and morbidity rate than those did not. Uh, British Malaya was quite successful in implementing this regulation in Southeast Asia, although around 40,000 people were still dead in the colony. Moreover, uh, those efforts were probably a traditional term for social distancing practices, and that is where the belief for what has now been called flattening the curve appear. As Dr. Port already argued, uh, one dramatic aspect of the pandemic response is the desire to attribute responsibility. Uh, from Jews in medieval Europe to butchers in, in Chinese markets, someone is always blamed. And as, uh, as uh, Ivan Krastev argued, this discourse of blame exploits existing social divisions of religion, race, ethnicity, class, or gender identity. In late 1918, anti-Hispanic caricatures could be found everywhere in American newspapers. The use of the term Spanish influenza, influenza itself was already problematic, given the fact that the pandemic was probably started in the US. Anti-Chinese hostility has also been a repeated problem, whether with plague uh, plug in San Francisco in 1900, SARS in 2003 or COVID-19 today. Uh, there were also lots of miscoordination and in essential disputes between uh, different levels of government. Uh, during the 1918 influenza outbreak in Indonesia, as Ghani already pointed in his presentation, the regional and central government have never been one voice in handling the pandemic. Uh, Confuci Confucian uh, led many people to rely on traditional treatments and, and medicines. And these petty battles between politicians have a very neg a negative effect on, on the administration of good pandemic care. Uh, as John Barry said, in times of contagious crisis, politics have to end with the micro. We have to all work together to come up with the best policies and the best methods to, en to ensure the health of the people. And another important key to disease control is an accurate and open information, uh, especially in the current situation when news spreads uh, at the speed of sounds. And in 1918, uh, pressure to maintain tranquility and order, neither national nor local government officials told the truth. Uh, the Dutch colonial government even called the disease as ordinary influenza by another name. And even after the beginning uh, of the second wave, uh, which already killed thousands of people, uh, the Dutch government still insists that there is no cause for alarm. And most uh, local health commissioners then follow that lead. Newspapers also echo them. The ignorance then resulted in the absence of mitigation. More than 1.5 million people in the Dutch East Indies died within just three months. And it was apparent that uh, Dutch colonial government never had a grand design nor preventive measures uh, towards epidemic or pandemic. Uh, health policy making in the Indies was more incidental and unplanned. And uh, as the outbreak uh, of COVID continues and uh, new cases of the disease increase globally, 
uh, there is pressure on historians to show the significance of history for, for policy. Historians who never uh, lost interest in epidemics uh, can glean insights from the ongoing pandemic for future disease preparedness and prevention. And by emphasizing the need to learn from past lessons, this field, uh, however, seem does not really attract people's interests. History and medicine are always seen as two separate and, are, and, and unrelated subject. Uh, they are treated as if they could not complement each other. And in many countries, uh, in Indonesia, the history of medicine and pandemics are entirely missing from school and university curriculum. Uh, the 1918 influenza became a great example of how a pandemic, uh, as Christy Walker argued, can belong to the intersection of histories of health and medicine and histories of the transnational interactions and connections, uh, which characterized by early 20th century Southeast Asia. And history has shown uh, how any outbreak anywhere can quickly go everywhere. And we have to work together, not just at the local, state, and even the federal, but also at the international level. There has to be close cooperation and surveillance in each country. There has to be open and transparent reporting, and there have to be active and rapid responses when outbreaks are identified. It was true that we don't know about infectious diseases until they break out, but we need to learn from our past lessons to fully understand about the steps we need to take for the preparedness. This COVID-19 became a strong momentum for policymakers to improve regulation for anticipating future epidemics or pandemics. By doing so, uh, I believe we will have a healthier world. Maybe that's all. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Avando. Um, we now proceed to the um, question and answer portion. Uh, yeah, if you can still uh, send those questions, keep those questions coming. Um, okay, so I'll go through each of every, every question. Uh, I, I guess this one is addressed to Dr. Gani. Okay, uh, this is a question from Johannes Adianto from Universitas Sri Vijaya. Uh, and the question is, um, it, in what ways was the flu pandemic a key factor for the movement of the colonial center to Konings Plain in the case of Batavia? And uh, there's a second question here. Uh, I, I don't know if it is uh, related to your topic, but... Um, why was the SARS and MERS did not? Why were SARS and MERS were, uh, did not have as much uh, as impact in Indonesia uh, during those times? Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, first, from uh, Johannes Adianto uh, about the. A key uh, pandem flu pandemic as a key factor of movement, colonial center to punishment. Uh, I think I would say that uh, the shifting uh, colonial center to the Konings plan, it was happened in uh, 19th uh, century. And as, as, far, as, as, far, as, uh, as far as I, I read about the history of Batavia uh, and the history of disease, uh, what happened? in Batavia was more uh, an environmental issue. First, Batavia was a port city, a very close city, so that the air circulated terribly. And at the time, the, the bad circulation of the air was one of the cause of the, of the disease. And the second, the canals, as I already mentioned, was the place for mosquitoes to breed. So, uh, and moreover, the dysentery and cholera was as well the disease caused by unhygienic uh, water in, in Batavia. That environmental factor uh, was uh, the cause for the shifting of the center colonial from the old Batavia to the, to, to the new one. Okay. And the second is about the SARS. Uh, about the, the SARS, the, the previous corona uh, viruses. So uh, I don't know much about this, but I, I, I can say that the previous coronavirus did affect Indonesia, but more 
more on the poultry industry. That as far as I, 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 uh, as I read. The character of the virus was very different as well. As, uh, as we already know, the, the COVID-19 is transmitted easily from human to, to human. That's why the treatment about what happened in the previous uh, SARS is kind of uh, different. And there is also another question about the, how the colonial, uh, how the colonial authority uh, treat uh, deal with the pandemics uh, in 1918. I can say that the colonial government formed a committee to deal with the pandemic flu. The government published as well the popular book, one of them called Awas Penyakit Influenza. Be careful about the influenza, uh, about the influenza. This is uh, the book, the form of the book is a dialogue between two people about the danger of the influenza and how to deal with it by consulting a modern medicine. Because at that time, uh, there were a lot of uh, people when uh, when they uh, when they deal with the uh, with the disease, uh, they, they use some kind of supernatural uh, treatment. They they went to the uh, traditional healers. Uh, that's why in this book uh, they mention that consulting a modern medicine is very very important. And as well in that book, uh, it was also mentioned that uh, the practicing a hygienic lifestyle. And lastly, consuming uh, a pill called tablet, tablet Bandung. So that was, uh, but it was very, very late. Uh, the publication of the book was in uh, 1920 and, uh, uh, and, and the committee was also uh, established in 1919 or 1920. I, I forgot exactly uh, when it was. And, also, uh, there was uh, another question. I don't know if there is still any question for me. I, I'll, I'll, I think I will uh, ask more questions later, Paul. Okay. Uh, pa. uh, anyway, um, I'll, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, and, and I think this is addressed to the three, um, the three speakers. Um, this is from uh, Yuliarni from the Universitas Muhammadiyah Palembang, and she asks, uh, secara umum adakah perbedaan respon tanggapan masyarakat dulu dan sekarang terhadap pandemi yang melanda baik saat dulu dan sekarang? I guess what she's trying to uh, ask is, uh, what's the difference between uh, the reception on the part of the, uh, of the people? Uh, what's the differences between then and now? So uh, uh, any of the three speakers can uh, answer this. Um, do you want Pagani? Do you want to start off with it? Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. So, uh, how the people react in the past time and and the, and the, and the present time? Uh, I think uh, the reaction is not uh, very very different. First of all. Uh, uh the when when the disease or when the epidemics uh coming uh people still believe that this is kind of punishment from from god so another there was also a kind of uh what we call now a cons, uh, cons conspiracy uh theory and yeah there was also an explanation that there was a, a, a conspiracy uh, theory about the, about the disease. It was also happened in the uh, in the in the in the past times. So uh, I think uh, the, the 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 reaction is uh, not very uh, uh, not very different. Maybe another speaker can can add for the explanation. Um, Doctor Poor. Um, Sorry, I forgot to open my microphone. Okay. <laughs> yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. I think one of the one of the 
great difference. You can see that today people are more um, educated that one in one sense. And then it, everyone, almost everyone has a smartphone. So you can easily have access to information. But of course, people also have access to a lot of misinformation today uh, uh, co compared to the past. Okay. And, and, but uh, relatively, I think today uh, people can, more people can understand um, you know, uh, the disease easily than, than in the past in, because uh, it, it's very difficult to explain, uh, you know, what, what, what uh, the, especially when um, the disease is not really well known, like what uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Kamage just mentioned just now, uh, you know, uh, people were groping, you know, people in the past, they were groping. And then even today, you know, it takes us some time to really understand what's happening. You know, the, to, to understand the disease uh, a little bit better. For example, today you can see that whether to use a mask or not, there are so many debates, okay? And, and, and in, in Singapore, it has been debated a lot. And in Malaysia as well, you know, the government sometimes they just changed the policy at the beginning. Uh, using a mask was encouraged, but then at a point, uh, the government uh, were telling people that no, the, don't use masks. Okay, the reason for uh, asking people not to use a mask is actually that there was a reason for it because there was already a shortage of uh, masks in the market, and then there was this uh, worry that you know if there's a shortage, you're likely to endanger the frontliners who need the mask most. If you encourage people, everyone, to buy masks in the market, then you will cause a shortage of a uh, mask. So there was this issue, okay. But then uh, back then, I think um, that the, the, there wasn't really a lot of information about wearing masks, okay. Uh, in terms of British Malaya, lah, okay, there wasn't really a lot of information like people's responses to wearing a mask or even people's access to uh, masks. Okay, because even today, even today, uh, different groups of people have different degree of access to masks. Not everyone can afford to buy, this is one thing. And then the second thing is the availability. You know, sometimes certain places you have more supply of masks than other places, even within one country, you know, different geographical area, the situation is very different. And then the people's responses to it as well is very different. Okay, that's basically what I, what I can... My, my response. I hope I answer the question. Yes, Dr. Francis. Yes. Um, thank you for the for the very interesting question. I I think uh, I I share the the assessment and the evaluation of the other uh, panelists um, in saying that there there, there were a lot of uh, parallelisms. Uh, that can be advanced with regard to the experience of uh, the different pandemics that visited our region. Uh, but suffice it to say, I would like to, to also mention um, and, and reiterate what uh, the others had mentioned. The, the flow of information is very important. And the way the information is being relayed to the general public is equally important whether the information is being relayed in a, in a manner that's understandable to the, to the people or whether uh, the information being relayed will instill more fear uh, or intimidation or the perception uh, that they were up for a more tragic uh, experience um, is, is one thing. You know? uh, remember that uh, uh, the notion of public health is a social uh, issue. No, so it's it's not all, only a, a, an issue of of governance of who defines what uh, what uh, policy should be undertaken. First and foremost, it should be the welfare of the people uh, who should be uh, given into uh, primary consideration. Um, and and if if that is not taken uh, into account as a primary consideration then the, the, the other measures will uh, simply fall off the cliff. Um, and we had a, a number of tragic experiences regarding this. No? Uh, for example, as was already mentioned, um, 
in, in a number of cases, epidemics and diseases have been racialized or, or given a, a particular ethnic uh, character. It's as if you know, there is a difference between one set of human beings to the other. You know? But we're all human beings and uh, the, the microbes, the, the viruses and the bacteria actually do not distinguish uh, the skin color, the skin tone of the people or on who should be infected or not. That's one. No? And, but at, at the same time, in a highly uh, class divided society, one must also take into account the way the, the general public um, is uh, sort of experiencing uh, what may be per perceived as a level of victimization. Uh, so they were already sort of experiencing uh, the disease and they were being victimized by the disease, but the measures being undertaken by the authorities were at times perceived to be equally victimizing, you know, and that's also very, very crucial. So the social attitudes regarding all of these policies and practices and, and uh, uh, measures to be undertaken are, are very important you know, in history as well as in the present. You know. Uh, I, I think uh, I would also like to piggyback on what, what Dr. Kamagai mentioned as, um, you know, this time being an appropriate time not only for us uh, in the region to address our common concerns, but also to look at, you know, uh, the, the way our localities uh, confront and contend with the disease. No? And here lies the, the very importance of not only uh, local expressions, but also local notions about the disease. In Filipino, uh, it's, it's very peculiar because the notion of sakit and sakit, it's, it's also very similar to bahasa, I know. No? Uh, it may be a disease, but it may also be suffering, right? Uh, the, the notion of disease is not only the notion of you know, biological illness, but also a state of uh, suffering, you know, of not being socially uh, well, of not having the right psychological makeup, or of, 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 feeling, uh, of, uh, of, being, of feeling alone or being attacked or whatever. So that, that can also be looked into by, by local scholars of how uh, concepts and notions uh, regarding disease uh, are, are being utilized on the ground. No? They, they, they are not looking at extremely scientific technical terms no, in appreciating all of these things. But if you apply them to notions of sakit and pasakit, no, sakit is different from sakit in, in the Philippines, um, which, and it's, um, uh, anathema, the, the notion of galing, and uh, galing may also mean not only physical wellness, but also being able to cope with whatever challenges one uh, confronts. No? So if we look at all of these local expressions, and in, in the Philippines, for example, we had a, a number of um, local sources of prayers, of uh, even Tagalog poems, that express all of this, no, very critical of the draconian measures being implemented by the authorities, but at the same time, very expressive of how local perceptions should be uh, brought to the fore as a way of uh, uh, expressing or, or articulating you know, what uh, the people on the ground were actually feeling. And I, I think that's very relevant and important not only in history, but also at present. Salamat. Um, Sorry, I think, can I uh, respond a little bit more? A little bit more following Francis' response? Yes, please. Thank you. I think uh, in, in, in the situation in Malaysia, you can see that we actually have more than 3 million migrant workers. And talking about people's, recep people's, uh, people's reception of the disease, we cannot think of just Malaysians. We have to think of including the migrant workers. And migrant workers, not everyone can read. This is one thing. Second is, it's, it's such a diverse community, it's such a diverse population because we have different 
uh, migrants from different parts of Southeast Asia. They speak different language. So uh, talking about the state authority have to be responsive to the need of people on the ground. We have to take into consideration of this group of people. And then that means whatever information about the disease, about this outbreak, whatever government policy, let's say we had uh, we imposed lockdown in um, since the mid of March, right? And you know, I can see that probably a lot of migrant workers they were in the dark. What's happening in this country? Why everything is like shutting down? You know, if they were not informed about this, then they cannot self protect. It's us to blame. You know, when we cannot give uh, accurate information to this group of people, you know, so that. Um, they are safe, they can, they can practice self-protect and instead of rounding them, them up. And, and it happens in, it finally happens in early May that uh, you know, Malaysian government rounded up migrant workers and then they be, immediately, they were so stigmatized from that moment on. Yeah, so this is uh, just uh, carry on with the uh, conversation about information and then, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank sorry, you. Ferdi. <laughs> Can I also uh, add uh, to what a uh, very important point uh, mentioned by uh, Paul here? I think also the, the level of marginalization and powerlessness um, regarding uh, the way authorities were combating the disease on the one hand, and on the other hand, the, the, the marginalized people, those who were uh, um, in, the, in the margins of society and history, should also be uh, taken uh, into account. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think that uh, also satisfies the question of Maria Nella Florendo as well, because she she also asked that same question about how how you know Southeast Asians reacted to colonial government policies. Uh, in any case, uh, let's proceed to the next question. Well, it, uh, as, since you mentioned something about um, reactions anyway, um, was there, was there an, uh, like this question was being posed by Kevin Santos, was there a concentrate, and I guess I can direct this to the three uh, of the speakers, uh, was there a an orchestrated move uh, when these epidemics broke out in the 19th and 20th century, where were especially like the Spanish flu, for example, where were this a, was there a concerted move among between the or amongst the co colonial powers in Southeast Asia to try and uh, you know contain this, or was it merely a uh, uh, was it merely just focused on their respective territorial domains? Was there a you know concerted effort? Uh, I, I may address this to any of the three speakers if you know based on your studies. Um, yes, Ferdi. Yeah. Um. What? What? what uh, I probably would like to address this to the three speakers if you know, based on your studies, was was were there you know in the past. Uh, especially in the, during the Spanish flu, were there, was there a concerted effort amongst the colonial powers to try to cooperate in resolving this health, uh, this, uh, you know, this crisis? Or were they just more, you know, uh, focused in their uh, own respective uh, colonial spheres of influence? Ferdi, can I uh, begin answering that? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, both are, are correct. No, the, the colonial authorities were of course, minding their own colonies. Uh, so the Americans were concerned with American public health policies in the Philippines, the Dutch in the, the case of uh, the Dutch East Indies, uh, the British in the British Malaya, uh, Burma, India colonies. But remember also that there, uh, there were a, a number of um, a, a medical and scientific conferences in the region that happened uh, as a result of, or even before and after uh, these pandemic uh, breakouts. No? Um, uh, of course, these were mostly represented by the colonial masters, but they were uh, not only looking at ways of uh, learning from each other and coordinating with one another. Remember, there was also this power play, you know, how 
one colonial master can get the upper hand vis-a-vis you know, -vis the, the others. Uh, so for example, in the case of the Philippines, some of the American uh, medical health officials were coordinating with British and Dutch, as well as Japanese officials, you know, uh, Manila, Shanghai, um, and if I am not mistaken, I think Saigon or, or uh, Singapore, I, I'm not sure about the latter two, hosted these medical and scientific conferences. Um, and they were able to come up with uh, measures of coordination between and among the different uh, health authorities. Whether these measures were really implemented or were they, were they effective enough is, uh, is another uh, case in point. No? But at least there, there were already attempts. No? Um, the, uh, the institutionalization of the World Health Organization, of course, would come at a latter day period. But there were already some notions of uh, um, coordination with the realization that uh, viruses and, and microbes actually do not uh, consider national or colonial boundaries in the first place. You know, and you know, if one part of the region is affected, then the other uh, parts can easily be affected as well. So it was based on that realization. The other thing that maybe some of the panelists may also uh, answer is the way, uh, piggybacking again on what Dr. Kamagai mentioned, the way local uh, medical practitioners uh, were behaving and looking at the other uh, societies in the region. Because I know, for example, of um, studies made by Filipino illustrados in the late 19th century. Some of them uh, became activists, uh, political activists, of course, but originally they were doctors. No? Uh, you have Dominador Gomez, you have Jose Rizal, you have Trinidad Pardo de Tavera, you have a lot of uh, medical practitioners who were also, on the one hand, um, uh, writing about their political pieces, but at the same time, they were also writing about scientific and medical studies. You know, the, the very famous um, General Antonio Luna had his master's thesis, medical thesis on malaria, for example, and, and or uh, Trinidad, Dr. Trinidad Pardo de Tavera wrote something about uh, indigenous medical practices and herbal medicine in, in Southeast Asia. So, uh, so things like those no, should also be taken into account no, beyond, the beyond the level of the colonial state and beyond the, the institutionalized way of interacting, coordinating with one another. How are the local practitioners, no, both the formal professional medical practitioners and the, what the colonial masters would call the non-formal or traditional medical practitioners? Uh, we're reacting to this. No, I, I think we have a lot to study you know, on, on this topic as well. Thank you. I, I think uh, in, in regards to this question, I think Philippine scholars and Indonesian historians uh, have been doing much more thing and, and much ahead than uh, uh, than Malaysian historian because uh, yeah, this is a international health and and uh, you know with the focus on the perspective by South, 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 South Asian uh, medical doctors or, 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 or whichever group, okay, but it's from Southeast Asia. Uh, I think this is still very understudied um, in, in, in the case of uh, in the situation of Malaysia. And, and I can see that there are like uh, Mercedes, she has done a lot on international health, right? And then uh, Indonesia, I can see that uh, in terms of the involvement of Native um, medical doctors, Indonesia has done a lot as well, like um, Hans Pauls and uh, as well as uh, um, Vivek. These are two, yeah, who have done a lot of uh, the, the roles of uh, native medical doctors. And Philippines, Philippines is the, the one with the most uh, comprehensive study, like uh, the role of uh, the, the, um, the elites, Filipino elites, yeah. So I don't have much to say in, in, in this respect. Huh? Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, regarding this question, uh, I would like to add some information about what, uh, from the Indonesian history. 
for example, the, the collaboration between the colonial government with the uh, religious uh, leader, we can read it from the history of the vaccination in the early 19th uh, century. It was uh, when uh, the program of the vaccination in the mid 19th, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the early 19th century was uh, very, at, at, the, at the beginning, it was very uh, difficult to, uh, to be uh, put in practice because there was a resistance from the, from the people. Uh, the, the local people said that uh, putting something uh, stranger from the outside to our body, it is a very, uh, in, in, in religious terms, called haram. So, uh, but at the, at the same time, the, the small, smallpox it was very widespread among the population. That's why one of the uh, one of the physician who also a naturalist and ethnograph, uh, Andreas de Wilder, he uh, start to work with the uh, religious leader in West Java, and the program was very successful. Uh, even uh, Thomas Stamford Raffles in his uh, in his book uh, The History of Java. He uh, he admit the success of the Andres the the in the program of the of the vaccination. Uh, move to the we, we, uh, in another uh, example for, for, uh, in early nineteenth century uh, when we talk about the uh, the transmission of the syphilis, the, the the religious leader was also called to to uh, to work together, but they. Uh, uh, the, the religious leader put some uh, put some uh, emphasis on the moral aspect of the uh, of the of the, of the syphilis. They say that uh, we have to uh, stay away from the uh, from the uh, prostitution or uh, sexual relation uh, outside outside the, the the marriage institution. But that was a very uh, uh, more from the moral point of, point of view, and uh, talking about the the collaboration between the the physician in Indonesia uh, and especially this is a uh, European physician uh, working in uh, Netherlands, India, and another colony in Southeast Asia. I have a, a very interesting uh, example from. A doctor, uh, a, a Dutch doctor called Alan de Hart, when he was about to establish uh, the Institute Pasteur in Jakarta. As we already know, the Institute Pasteur is uh, a very uh, international establishment, and it was almost in the colonial, a uh, French colonial. Uh, they have uh, Institute Pasteur, but in Indonesia. Uh, Ella de Han, they, they established an institute pastor with, which has no uh, which has with, uh, has not related to the institute pastor in in Paris because when I tried to uh, to open the archive there there was no uh, uh, information about the institution uh, institute pastor in in Batavia. But uh, the very interesting uh, from the stories he was about to establish, and when they were about, were about to uh, to create a vaccine for the rage, uh, he, he went to uh, he went to Paris to learn from Doctor Rowe, and uh, when he went back to Netherlands, Indy, he brought with him uh, a sample of the vaccine for the rage. But when he arrived in Batavia, the, the vaccine was not active. At the time, she tried to write to the Institute Pasteur, the director of Institute Pasteur in Vietnam, in, in Indochina. So they got the, the supply, the new, the fresh uh, vaccine from uh, the director of the Institute Pasteur in Indochina. So I think it is a very, uh, a very uh, interesting uh, topic to be studied and the, the relationship between uh, 
a doctor working in Indonesia and another part of in Southeast Asia. Okay. I think that's all. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, my, I guess the next question, since we're talking about reactions anyway, or uh, responses, um, I'm going to uh, ask two, uh, two questions. This one is from uh, Rohan de Gorongan from, and, uh, from the Philippines and uh, Faust Edward Damaso. Um, and again, this is addressed to the three speakers in your studies of the epidemics or pandemics in your particular areas. Uh, first question is, here is, uh, were there any records of psychological distress to the people affected by the, epi uh, by the pandemic or epidemic? Or, you know, you know how uh, in, did you find any, uh, did you have any findings as regards to anxiety or restlessness to these societies? Uh, secondly, second question has something to do with um, your study, what, uh, how about the disposal of the dead? Were, were there any cultural or political issues regarding the burying of the dead? And, you know, in particularly in, uh, uh, in uh, the Islamic communities, for example. Thank you. So any of the three may start? Ready? Yes? Can I? Yeah, 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 please. Okay. Um, in 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 the case of the Philippines, uh, for the second for the for the second question, there was a great deal of controversy regarding the disposal of the dead, particularly uh, those who succumb to the cholera uh, pandemic, because the uh, protocol was cremation, the burning of the bodies uh, of 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 the uh, uh, the deceased. Uh, those who died of uh, of cholera, but of course cremation was never part of the the tradition in a funeral tradition in the Philippines. The tradition was that the the body will be placed in a coffin and there will be several nights of vigil, uh, socialization, and all of this. No? So all of these were uh, prevented and prohibited. No. And not only that, they will take the, the body of the dead and uh, bring it to the crematorium, to the horror of the, of the relatives, you know. Um, so some people actually resorted to smuggling the bodies of their dead relatives, you know, or even burying them without the notification to the authorities, or letting them float in the river or whatever. To them, that's a better option than seeing the bodies of their dead relatives being burned or cremated. You know, uh, that's one. Uh, so it's it's not only uh, the, the issue of cremation, but also the issue of uh, a funeral uh, vigil being a social event. You know, um, so the prohibition to social gathering was implemented, and and therefore what will happen to the funeral vigils? You know, so a lot of body smuggling, if you will, uh, if you will call it as body smuggling happened and were recorded actually. Uh, regarding the first question, uh, of course the, the idea of uh, psychological distress was a relatively new phenomenon, uh, even in the medical field. But again, uh, expressions of uh, distress uh, were all over in the, in the records, you know, ranging from reactions uh, uh, against those who were perceived to be perpetrators. Uh, so there were a, a, a great deal of xenophobia, for example, that went on um, in the 1819-1820 cholera epidemic. There was even an anti-foreign, anti, uh, very directed anti-Chinese riot, you know, because they, they believe that the, the Chinese were and the Spaniards were not dying of cholera and that the, but the local population were dying you know without realizing the fact that for example practices like drinking uh, tea or coffee uh, may have prevented them from drinking contaminated water and to the local population it's better for them to drink cold water from the from the uh, earthen clay pot or or uh, from the river direct or from the well uh, which may have been contaminated, but of course the perception was different. You know, the level of psychological distress and anxiety can also be realized to be observed during the the 
uh, cholera and influenza pandemic uh, in the Philippines, you know, uh, rem especially in the case of cholera because we were under uh, the first years of American occupation. So there was war condition uh, still. You know? um, and in the case of the 1918-1919 uh, influenza pandemic, the idea that the Filipinos were being, for the first time, uh, placed as uh, uh, heads and directors of health institutions uh, because of the American policy of Filip Filipinization. But at the same time, they were being blamed you know, for the disease that were not their own making. You know? um, so things like those also happened. Uh, and, and again, no, the, the uh, capacity of society to relay the necessary correct information uh, in a timely manner is essential in this. Otherwise, all of the system will, will uh, fall. Okay, thank you. I think that is a very, very interesting question. I'm actually very interested in uh, the issue of a death management or management of uh, remains, uh, human remains. Uh, but uh, in terms of the past pandemic, I haven't come across any study of a death management uh, uh, in past pandemic. Uh, even Liu Kai Kun's uh, article didn't mention anything about, he did mention a little bit about um, grave digger. Uh, they were asking for to be more well paid because the workload is so much uh, heavier than uh, usual time, but then they were not paid well. There is only one line mentioning this. So uh, this is one interesting topic to pursue. I mean, for anyone who is interested, yeah, yeah, and, and not just if uh, the the handling remains of uh, leprosy patients is is another fascinating issue. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, that's a different topic, lah. Okay, that's what I can respond. Okay, uh, regarding the second question. Uh, from the present case of the pandemic, there are a lot of debate about how to uh, how to deal with the dead uh, body, and there was also the case of smuggling body from the hospital, and which caused the the spread of the of the of the disease. But that uh, but that is uh, the present case of uh, the COVID nineteen. In the past time. Uh, as far as I read from the sources, well, there was also uh, the case of uh, the plague in uh, 1930. It was a very interesting case because at the time, what we call, we call the long, uh, the lung plague, uh, the plague that uh, that transmits with the respiration. So it was a very uh, dangerous at that time. So. To know, uh, to identify whether the the dead body was uh, uh, the death was caused by the plague or not, uh, we need to inject uh, the body. We need to take the sample uh, from the dead body, and that was the uh, the problem. At the time, the uh, the religious uh, leader said that uh, we uh, we are not allowed. To, uh, to touch or to take something uh, or to destroy uh, the, 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 the dead body. But uh, there was a, 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 a physician, a local physician, Dr. Ahmad Ramali. Uh, he was uh, graduated from Stofia Medical School in Batavia in 1928 or 30. Uh, and <clears throat> besides he was uh, a physician, was also a religious uh, leader. He learned uh, religious very deeply from a very prominent uh, religious uh, uh, political leader at the time, Haji Abu Salim. So he, he learned a lot from Haji Abu Salim. And when uh, another religious leader confront uh, against the, the injection of the body, uh, of the dead body, uh, he said with uh, he said that actually the religion allowed to uh, to do that and he put beside uh, uh, 
beside the medical uh, reason, of course, uh, they would also uh, some uh, religious, uh, uh, same religious argument. And at that time, people, uh, of course, not all of them, but most of religious leader can uh, understand that uh, in the end, we are allowed to uh, to inject the body because if it is for the good of the whole population, uh, we are allowed to do what is in the beginning prohibited. I think that is uh, the the very uh, interesting uh, topic. I, I I wrote about that uh, in my previous article about actually about Dr. Ramali. That's all, Faye. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess we're running out of time, but uh, you know, just to probably ask um, two more questions, maybe. Um, and I, I guess my first question, my first question has something to do with. Uh, I, I was a, a bit intrigued about uh, what Mr. Ravando mentioned earlier about the connection, the intersection between uh, health and uh, medicine and the pandemics is because like, for example, uh, to cite in the 1902 cholera uh, epidemic in the Philippines, for example, one of, the, one of the solutions that came up there or one of the ways by which Filipinos tried to cure themselves of the, of the cholera was uh, to uh, try smoking opium. That's how they started, uh, that's how they started uh, you know, the, the, the drug epidemic, the opium epidemic in the Philippines started when Filipinos started taking in opium during the 1902 cholera uh, epidemic. So basically that's, uh, you know, that's uh, perhaps that might be one of the things that we might want to explore. Whether in your, you know, in your particular areas of study where there inter um, the extent by which there were intersections between, uh, you know, people searching for cures, uh, in response of these uh, to these uh, epidemics, and uh, I guess the second question here is that, and probably this would be, I, I would probably address this to all of the five, so uh, including the reactors. Um, then this is a question from Wesley Reyes. He's, he asks, uh, compared from then to till until now, compared to the way the colonial powers managed it then, and the, the looking back as to the present day uh, Southeast Asians managing their own thing. Are we better off in terms of management or, you know, was it, you know, was it the same? So probably I can address it to the, uh, everyone. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ferdy. So perhaps I would like to ask like your question about like the use of opium, for example, like to, to, in order like to tackle the pandemics. Um, I found like several cases that uh, like several doctors they try to use like the opiums in order like to cure the the, in, the influenza patients because uh, for example when the first wave started in the in in the Indies like early July um, they have they really have no idea like about the medicine that they can use so a lot of them uh, they thought that they can use uh, quinine or opium as like the uh, first uh, medical aid like to, to cure the patients. And later on, when the government uh, started to introduce the Dover's powder as like the main medicines in, in form of tablet, uh, it also like created a lot of controversy in, in the country because, it, because one of the substance in, in, in the medicine is also opium. But still, um, even though a lot of people like protested about the using of the the, the, the first powder. It was uh, be becoming like one of the main medicine that that was used to cure the influenza patients. And it's also interesting to see like how the different community also have different actions to tackle the pandemics. For example, like uh, like the Chinese community, uh, it was like quite common during that time. Uh, they they create like a big parade. Uh, like they go like around the city, they call it uh, Chua Pe Kong. Uh, so they, they, they bring like the second statue and then they go around the city because they believe that it, it will like tackle the pandemic. Um, but while at the same time, they also pray that the, uh, that, that rain will, will, will come and then it will like wash out like, wash out like the pandemics, even though like in, in most of the cases it, it didn't happen or it's not really, it's not really a good thing like to do because, uh, 
it 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 spread like the virus even even like further and even like this the the local community like the bumi putra community like the 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 indonesian uh, community they also have uh, this kind of thing because they because a lot of them they thought that this is uh, like the as gani already mentioned this is like the result of of the punishment from from God or from 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 Dewa, for example, and like in Kraton Yogyakarta, in Yogyakarta Police, and also in Kraton Surakarta, they started like to to bring out like all the weapons, uh, and then because they believe that one of the weapons uh, called Kiai Tunggulung, for example, it's like one of the uh, uh, it's it's actually it's, it's not a weapon, but then it's like a flag which uh, always. Like brought out like from the police whenever like an outbreak or epidemic happened, and then they started like to to create like a big parade like from all around Jakarta, and this kind of 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 parade was quite common at the time. And different com community they also have different actions like to 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 tackle the pandemic. And I think like this is the thing that uh, is not really uh, discussed. For example, like in in colonial reports, uh, it's not really. Uh, well written and it's not really well discussed so still like plenty of uh, room like to to learn about it i think thank you yes dr kamagai uh, uh, i yeah. think uh, i will go back to for uh, uh paper what is the difference now she mentioned that the colonial authorities did not take responsibility. Now we have to take responsibility. We're independent. We're no longer under a colonial power. So that's a bigger task because you don't have, no longer have a scapegoat uh, to, to fall back on. So I think that's one big difference. I think also a big difference that she mentioned is that there are new technologies which were not present in the past. So I think just those two really uh, makes a big difference from the previous epidemics or pandemics and the present one. So those are my reactions. Uh, speakers, you have. Okay, maybe uh, I find that this uh, the response of a uh, medicine and health system, universal healthcare system, and to uh, actually there is one uh, response or question from the the chat. Huh? I think that is is related. Right? It's very interesting. The question asks: Is socialist health system more? Uh, efficient model in responding to pandemics. Uh, I think this is interesting because if we look at the responses in, U, uh, in Europe uh, to this pandemic, it's very interesting. In the past, we have been so um, influenced by this colonial perspective that, you know, the white people, the white men are always great. But if you look at Europe today, they, especially the Northern Europe, they have such a good health system, but their responses to this pandemic, actually, you can see that, I don't know what's happening to them. And especially Swedish, the, the, the Swedish government's response to this pandemic is so, uh, I don't know how, I can't find any words to describe, but it's just like so lagging that causing a lot of death. So it actually is a good, time that we should relearn our perception of all these you know the colonial the europeans are better than than asian but uh, but of course we need to go get go back to what uh, uh professor kamage just mentioned uh in in asia we are no longer you know uh colonized uh, now we are already independent state things are in our hands so it's up to us to shape the system that we want rather than you know letting it like uh you know uh, not taking responsibility of uh people's health uh, we should actually push for universal access of medicine for everyone yeah that's what i can respond Okay, I want to add something uh, from what uh, Rafando has uh, already uh, mentioned just now, because from the uh, I think uh, 
from what I read, uh, the way the people, the local people respond, or so the community respond to the coming of the of the epidemics at the time was quite different. But well, one of them was there was a kind of uh, 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 a right in the, uh, in the in the local people when someone was sick, uh, they will call a local healer and they will uh, they will burn some incense and so. Uh, instead of uh, giving the air of uh, for the for the sick for the patient, so it was uh, it was only worsened the, uh, the the sick. So it was very uh, uh, quite common uh, in, uh, uh, in the in the in the, uh, uh, in the practice at the at the local people at that time. So I think, uh, but from what. Uh, uh, I will just. Uh, I, I want to continue to uh, to give a comment from what just uh, Dr. Paul uh, mentioned. Uh, even though uh, yes, we are uh, no longer in a colonized uh, in a colonial uh, state, uh, colonization was end. But I think uh, we still see the same uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the the same problem. If the at the at the colonial period we. Uh, the access to the health system was only uh, was only European privilege, or the uh, in, in the Indonesian case was also the, the aristocrat. Uh, but uh, uh, everybody, uh, everyone hoped that after the, the colonization, uh, every uh, every people, everyone could get the access to the to the health system. But in in the case of Indonesia now, I think. Uh, the access to the healthcare is still very, uh, very, uh, very difficult, especially for the uh, for the lower class uh, for the lower class people. You know, because uh, recently, for example, the government uh, raised the uh, the payment for the for the insurance, even in the in this time of the, the of the pandemics. So. Uh, so what I want to say is, uh, even though the the colonial uh, regime has ended, but I think they still use the same uh, 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 the same uh, way of thought how to, uh, to how to treat uh, the people, and and that what uh, and at that point, I see that the problem is not only uh, the colonization. The colonization, I, I mean, not only a racial. Uh, a, a racial problem, but also uh, there was a, a, a class a, a class problem because the lower class, the popular class, uh, from the uh, from the colonial period until now, was the, uh, the, the 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 one who is very susceptible to uh, to the disease. I think that's my that's all. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Dr. Fratty. Okay. Yes, uh, thanks uh, to, to the others. No? Um, and I would like to, to uh, piggyback again on what has already men has, has been mentioned. Uh, I agree with Dr. Kamagai uh, and, and Dr. Poor uh, that we already have um, the same, uh, relatively more scientific know-how. We, we have uh, a, the international institutions for coordination and information dissemination in place, supposedly already, uh, and this should be guiding the the public health uh, officials. No, and at the same time, I also agree with what Gani mentioned no? that uh, uh, what is equally important is the question of access, universal access. I think also Paul mentioned this. Uh, so there, because. Previously, in, even in colonial or in the immediate post-independence uh, period, uh, public health was really a public enterprise. Uh, but right now, because of the increasing pressure on uh, the commercialization of social services, there is a great deal of um, privatization of uh, the medical care system, not only in the delivery of uh, healthcare, but also in the insurance system, medical insurance system, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Poor. So uh, while it is true that uh, the epidemic should be confronted as a public health issue, 
in some societies, it became a public health issue being confronted by private commercial enterprises. So that's uh, really, I think, one of the uh, essential problematics in, in the way some countries were able or unable to deal with, with the disease. No? So you have the disparity, for example, with regard to the per capita mortality rate in the United States with a highly commercialized, highly privatized, non-universal healthcare system versus the experience of Vietnam and Cuba uh, or some European countries or New Zealand, for example, uh, for that matter. No? So how, how governments evolved in terms of their systems of delivering medical care, public health care, and at the same time, also the question of access. Um, and I think Ghani touched a very important issue of access, particularly for the marginalized classes. You know, those who cannot afford uh, expensive private health care, those who cannot afford uh, expensive medical insurance policies were the ones being left behind. And unfortunately, these are to be reckoned with. You know. I, I think the case of Sweden, as mentioned by Dr. Poor, is another issue uh, that should be studied uh, uh, all its, on its own. No? Because of the, again, the debate on uh, whether natural herd immunity can be attained or you know, set the, let the virus take its own natural due course or do we simply let more institutionalized intervention mechanisms um, and defeat the virus? No? Remember in 1918, no, they also tried to look at that, no? uh, but they were looking at a different uh, modality. No? Uh, while they, they implemented non-pharmaceutical intervention mechanisms and NPI mechanisms, uh, they were scientifically and in terms of laboratory research, they were looking at it the wrong way. Now, they thought for more than 20 years that uh, influenza was caused by a bacteria. You know, it was only 27 years after that they developed a vaccine you know, and realized that it was a virus. Uh, so again, no, uh, scientific breakthroughs may take some time, but you know, we cannot also paralyze our own, uh, our own uh, societies, our own systems, you know, and let the private enterprises take their own due course. Uh, and I, I think we should be learning again from these experiences, not only in the past, but also in present contemporary societies you know, within the region and outside of the region. Okay, uh, with that, uh, I wish to thank the speakers and the panel reactors uh, for this uh, opportunity to share your knowledge. I, uh, there are still some questions, but unfortunately we cannot uh, handle them all or process them all. Um, may I give the uh, mic now to uh, uh, Mr. Fernie, uh, Dr. Fernie and Pa Andy. Silakan. Thank you, Mr. Victoria, for your excellent moderation of the webinar. Um, I'm very happy that we had a successful event this afternoon. I just wish we had more time to address all the questions. But nonetheless, I hope all of you uh, learned from this discussion and that the lessons we take with us from here on will guide us in the way we address the current crisis that we are facing worldwide. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Uh, I'm also very glad to follow this webinar today. Uh, it is very lively discussion and the information that was conveyed by speakers and director is of great value, yeah? So our understanding about the pandemic not only in our own national experience, but in a more wider perspective in the region in Southeast Asia. And I think Dr. Kamagai point uh, very important that the lesson from this webinar today that we should more sensitize ourselves and understanding about our own view about the disease 
and we must we now have to deal with it in our hand we don't have any scapegoat anymore and i think in addition i think it is beneficial for us also to widen our perspective in uh, yeah, regional term uh, which i believe from this webinar provide us a better understanding about the pandemic whether in the past or in the current situation and I am not thinking that we should continue to organize another activity at Dr. Fernando like this, with different topics that bring scholars to get from different regions in Southeast Asia together. Uh, maybe we can discuss it later. Uh, and Masyarakat Sejarawan Indonesia and Philippine Historical Association must or should collaborate more to develop other issues that we have in common in this region. And I think on behalf of Masyarakat Sejarawan Indonesia, I would like to express my gratitude and thanks to speakers, reactors, and participants of this webinar. Terima kasih. I will give you to On behalf of the Southeast Asian Research Center and Hub, as well as the Philippine Historical Association and the National Quincentennial Commission Committee, I'd also like to extend our thanks to our speakers, the reactors, and our moderator for this excellent, fantastic webinar. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sampai ketemu lagi. Sampai jumpa. Sampai jumpa.